Thanks so much for joining us today. We'd love to know how God is using this ministry to touch your life. So please take a moment and send us your story by going to ChristianLifeRantool.com and clicking on Amen Central. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. I, I would think at this point it would be better for me to bring up Mary and let her give her testimony, and uh, she can share the good news of Jesus Christ with us. Well, something that I would like you to keep in mind as you hear my testimony is a short teaching of Jesus in Matthew 22. It is his response to the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead but of the living. I am a believer who struggles with codependency and food addiction. My name is Mary. I was very shy and withdrawn as a child. I remember standing by a tree at recess, feeling very alone and out of place, not feeling that I could join into what the other children were doing. They really didn't want to play with me. I wasn't like them, was what I told myself. Many years later, I came to realize that I had felt this way because of the shame of being a victim of childhood sexual abuse. Another way that my inadequacies were reinforced was when my mother would go to parent-teacher conferences. When I would ask her what the teacher said about me, she would never tell me. She would turn away and say, it'll just go to your head. Apparently, it is bad to think well of yourself. I went to Sunday school on my own at some of the churches in the small town where I grew up, and I heard about God and how being a Christian was so great and that following Christ promised inner peace. I somehow missed the part about all the troubles in this world. I went to summer church camps also as I got older. At East Bay one summer, I heard the gospel for the first time and believed. It was explained to me that Jesus had died for my sins, and I trusted him as my Savior. But when I got home, I had no idea what to do next. There were no discipleship programs, especially not for preteens. The part of the church that I saw had it all together, and I certainly couldn't admit to them that I didn't. I was like the seed that fell among the stones and sprang up, but withered away because I had no roots. Years later, my mother asked me why I cried when I got back in the car after camp. She asked me if I had been saved. I don't think she knew what to do with me at the time. When I listened to the sermons at church, what I heard was that the Bible was just a list of do's and don'ts. So if I just tried really hard, I could make God be happy with me, and I would have all this peace that was preached about. But of course, I couldn't do it, so I would give up, turn away from God and do my own thing until I couldn't stand myself anymore. Then I would give God another try, still remembering the promises. I would try to live up to the list for a while, which of course I couldn't. I would feel condemned and not enjoy any of the benefits that were promised, so I would give up and turn away until I was miserable again. I went through this cycle several times in my life. In the meantime, I had become a nurse. I had managed to move far away from that little girl by the tree. I was actually secure and self-assured as a nurse. One day, I walked into a patient's room and started to talk to this cute little old lady. I felt confident and knowledgeable. Her daughter recognized me from my hometown and introduced herself. She was polite and friendly. Once I realized who she was, I remember suddenly feeling like I was the most worthless, insignificant nobody that ever walked the face of the earth. I walked out of the room, and I stopped to lean on the wall and ask myself, what the heck just happened? 
She definitely took me back to that lonely, good-for-nothing little girl who stood by the tree on the playground all through recess. And the depth of the feelings frightened me. Soon after that, I happened to see a talk show on TV where sexual abuse victims were yelling at their perpetrators. There was so much anger. I said to myself, matter-of-factly, hmm, that happened to me too. But I didn't feel any anger. In fact, I didn't feel anything. I wasn't sure what to think or do next. I mentioned it to a friend, and she said flatly, yeah, I think that happened to a lot of people. She didn't know what to do with me either. I became curious about my lack of anger on this subject, and one day as I was walking into church, a lady handed me a book and suggested I read it. Now, I'm sure there was a lot in that book, but what I got out of it was that it was okay to feel my emotions. Emotions are given to us by God, and they are okay. So I said to myself, very determined, all right, I'm going to give it a try. So when I watched a sad movie, I tried to let myself cry. I couldn't. I also found I couldn't express extremes of any emotion. I felt very dead inside. I knew something was wrong, but I wasn't sure what to do about it. After I was married, I returned to church with my children and joined a Bible study on Romans chapters 6, 7, and 8. For the first time, I learned about grace. This was a major turning point for me. I learned that there really isn't anything I can do that will be good enough, and God himself is the one who will empower me to change and enable me to do some of the do's and not do some of the don'ts. The condemnation lifted. Romans 8, 1 states, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I also started getting a real hunger for the word, and I got into a wide variety of Bible studies. I learned that those lists were such a small part of the Bible. I discovered that through his word, God was teaching me what he is like, and that made it much safer for me to examine my past. When I could rest in the loving arms of Jesus, I could expose even the most painful memory and receive healing. Trusting God by Jerry Bridges was probably the most significant study I did. I learned that God is sovereign. That means that he has complete control over everything that has happened or will happen. But, 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 I know that's what you're thinking. To reconcile sin and God's sovereignty is not an easy task. Unlocking the door to that dark corner of my life and allowing Jesus in was probably the hardest thing I ever did, but it was the only way to experience true freedom and peace and spiritual growth, and it didn't happen overnight. Just remember, it takes a lot to condense 60 years down to 15 minutes. Around the same time, I began to try to decide what should be my next step. I knew that people who have a past that includes sexual abuse often go to counseling. So I found a Christian counselor, and we started the hard work involved in exposing long-hidden events, ideas, and behavior patterns. He gave me several good books to read, and I read them all. One of the books was very deep and had a big section on repentance. I had no idea what it was really telling me. It confused me. Yes, the person who abused me needed to repent, but that wasn't what it was telling me. It was telling me that I needed to repent of all my wrong ways of thinking and behaving. Man, God doesn't pull any punches. He really expects us to do the hard work. My counselor had a particular teacher that he agreed with who taught that most of our problems are that we believe the lies of Satan and not the truths of God in Scripture. This teacher developed a series of prayers that dealt with a wide range of issues that are strongholds for people with abusive pasts and basically anybody with a hurt habit or hang-up. Totally scriptural, but also guaranteed to upset the evil spirits who had managed to keep me in turmoil for years. My counselor brought a video conference to my church And at the end of it, everyone is sitting in a big room, and on a video screen, the teacher explains each step. Then they turn off the video, and each person prays silently about the issue. 
When it came to the section on forgiveness, we were to make a list of everyone who had hurt us and that we needed to forgive because unforgiveness and bitterness give Satan an open door. We were to go down our list and pray and forgive each person. When I came to the person who had abused me, I cried out to the Lord, I can't forgive him for what he did. A volcano of emotion surged up inside me, and it took every ounce of my strength and will not to stand up and scream in the middle of that group, and it terrified me. I spent the rest of the time concentrating on controlling all those emotions that were pushed down all those years. Nobody around me had a clue to what was happening inside of me. I failed again, still not able to find the promised peace. As I sat there knowing the others around me were making progress and receiving healing and peace that I so desperately wanted, I heard a discouraging voice say to me, This is for other people, Mary. This isn't for you. Several months later, I was able to complete the prayers with a counselor. I have never felt so clean and free as I did that day. Step eight of the Celebrate Recovery Christ-Centered 12 Steps for Physical, Sexual, Emotional Abuse states, make a list of all persons who have harmed us and become willing to seek God's help in forgiving our perpetrators as well as forgiving ourselves. Realize we've also harmed others and become willing to make amends to them. One thing that teacher had done that was helpful to me was that he has made a list of scriptures that describe a Christian's identity in Christ. It is basically just taking what is taught in scripture and making it personal to me and how God sees me. I am accepted. I am secure. I am significant. So I used to look at different scriptures and do the same thing. And one day I found 2 Corinthians 2.15. We are, to God, the fragrance of Christ. And I wondered what that meant. As I meditated on it, I began to picture myself as a rose, with God leaning over and cupping his hands around me and just enjoying me for me, taking in a deep breath and enjoying my fragrance. I didn't have to do anything or say anything. He just enjoyed me for who I am. Now, I didn't tell anyone about this, not my husband, kids, friends, or anybody. My birthday landed in the middle of the conference, and the evening after I went through the prayers, a lady from a church who really didn't even know me came by and brought me a small birthday gift. And it was a plaque with a picture of a rose on it. It was as if God himself had given this to me. I did not have Celebrate Recovery in my life at that point. I was seeing the counselor and sharing some things with my neighbor, who also was leading the Bible study I was attending. It hurt me quite a bit when she insinuated that it was time for me to move on. She didn't know what to do with me either. It was hard to find others who were patient, accepting, and who didn't feel like they had to fix me. I think my struggles looked like a lack of faith to them, when in reality, that is where my faith grew the deepest. I got very discouraged and was ready to give up on the church. Remember that cycle I described earlier in my life? Well, I thought about it for a while. It is such hard work to look for a good church. But I decided that I just couldn't quit. I had to try again. God had been so good to me, even if people hadn't. After this struggle and decision, God spoke to me almost audibly, and he said, The reason you failed before was because your eyes were on yourself and what you couldn't do. And the reason you can't fail now is because your eyes are on me and what I can do. This is what I love about CR. Everything is based on scripture. Jesus is our one and only higher power. On September the 14th of 2012, my youngest son, Mark, committed suicide. He was 26 years old. 
He suffered from depression for many years and had been spiraling downward for his last year. Of course, I think about him every single day, and I used to wonder what I could have done to make things turn out differently. All the what-ifs could be torture sometimes. During this time of intense grief, my husband encouraged me to begin attending Celebrate Recovery. I was very impressed with the testimonies, teaching, and sharing. We grew to be a part of things and have enjoyed the honest, open atmosphere. Here, you know what to do with me. Listen, love, accept, support, and extend grace. I've learned how to examine my motives and behaviors and look once again to Jesus as my example. As I studied the book of Matthew a few years ago, I read how Jesus responded to Judas, knowing the poor decisions he was making, and how he responded to Peter, knowing he would deny him three times. Jesus could have stopped them both, but he did not. Jesus knew exactly what sins they would commit and how those sins would affect everyone involved, yet he didn't interfere. He allowed them to make their own poor choices, although he did try to talk some sense into them. Jesus was not codependent. I feel that I received healing from the Lord at that time from those questions and doubts about the what-ifs related to Mark's life and death. When Mark was 16, he was saved and gave his testimony when he was baptized. However, at the time of his death, he claimed to be an atheist. Soon after his death, I was agonizing over where his soul is now. And as I was crying out to the Lord about this, my neighbor called and left a message on my phone. When I went to listen to her message, I heard instead, The following message will be deleted from your mailbox from Mark Chambers, July 4th of 2012, from the Appalachian Trail where he went to backpack. This is Mark, and I'm calling to let you know that I'm alive. So I am totally convinced that God is real, he is alive and involved. If you are a newcomer, I would like to encourage you to begin the journey of recovery, knowing that you are not heading out on this journey alone or haphazardly. You might be 18 or 80. It doesn't matter. The reason you're here is because the Lord has led you here. I didn't start my journey until the Lord had determined that I was emotionally and spiritually ready. He is patient. Time doesn't mean anything to the Lord, but timing is everything. He knows your hurts, habits, and hang-ups better than you do. He will not overburden you, but will guide you slowly, purposely forward to confront them in his perfect timing. Psalm 51, 8 says, May the bones that you have broken rejoice. Sometimes in recovery it feels like someone is breaking our bones, but we learn to look past the pain to the joy Jesus promises us when our spirits are healed. The peace that passes understanding isn't just for other people, it's for you too. Thank you for letting me share. Good morning, church. I'm a follower of Jesus who has struggled with drugs and alcohol and currently struggles with talking to large groups of people. My name's Chad. I just want to share a little bit about Celebrate Recovery and our hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Um, this, this program has a very wide umbrella. It allows us to deal with all sorts of sin with Jesus as our higher power. And some of those, just briefly, are alcohol addiction, codependency, domestic violence, divorce, drug addiction, fear, anxiety, food addiction, gambling, guilt and anger, grief, hurts, habits, and hang-ups, low self-esteem, overspending, sexual abuse, and just about anything else that gets between us and Jesus Christ. A couple of these that we're going to read. First is chemically dependent. The problem, if you find you cannot quit drinking or using entirely, or if you have little control over the amount that you consume, you're probably an alcoholic and or an addict. And this pertains to prescription medications too, not just street drugs. If that is the case, you may be suffering from a problem which only a spiritual solution will conquer. 
the solution. Celebrate Recovery does not promise to solve your life's problems, but it can show you how to work through the eight principles of Celebrate Recovery found in the Beatitudes and the 12 steps of Celebrate Recovery with Jesus Christ as your higher power. Live without drinking, using one day at a time with the help of Jesus Christ. Stay away from the first drink. If there isn't a first one, there can't be a tenth one. Experience the true peace and serenity that you have been seeking. Restore and develop stronger relationships with God and others. Stop relying on dysfunctional, compulsive, and addictive behaviors as temporary fixes for pain. Apply the bib biblical principles of conviction, conversion, surrender, confession, restitution, prayer, quiet time, witnessing, and helping others, which are found within the eight recovery principles and the Christ-centered 12 steps to celebrate recovery. When life becomes impossible and passes into the region from which there is no return through human resources, there are but two alternatives. First, go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our own intolerable situation as best as we could. Or the second is to accept Jesus Christ as our higher power and get help. The second one I'm going to tell you about is freedom from anger. The problem with anger. Every person has a pattern of toxic behavior that can significantly damage the important and intimate relationships in his or her life. Anger is one of our ten basic God-given emotions this emotion can be constructive or destructive, depending upon our response. When most of us think of an angry person, we think of someone who destroys themselves and their relationships through uncontrollable outbursts of rage. We usually picture someone who goes around slamming doors, yelling loudly, and making life miserable for everyone, including themselves. Yet this is only one part of anger, as anger has many faces, equally as damaging and destructive is anger that is suppressed or stuffed. All anger, if allowed to, will, all anger, if allowed to, will continue to destructively influence our behaviors and attitudes, and will ultimately erupt from deep within the heart. Uh, just a couple of checks for anger. Um, I become impatient easily when things do not go according to my plan. When I am displeased with someone, I may shut down any communication with them or withdraw entirely. I do not easily forget when someone does me wrong. More often than not, I use sarcasm as a way of expressing humor. Codependency. This is going to be the last one I'm going to read about. The problem. On the surface, codependency sounds like Christian teaching. Codependents always put others first before taking care of themselves. Aren't Christians supposed to do that? Codependents give themselves away. Shouldn't Christians do the same? Codependents martyr themselves. Christianity honors its martyrs. Compliance patterns of a codependent you. We assume responsibilities for others' feelings and behaviors. Feel guilty about others' feelings and behaviors. Have difficulty identifying what we are feeling. Have difficulty expressing our feelings. Are afraid of our own anger, yet sometimes erupt in rage. Worry about how others may respond to your feelings, opinions, and behaviors. Have difficulties making decisions. Are afraid of being hurt and or rejected by others. Minimize, alter, or deny how we truly feel are very sensitive to how others are feeling and feel the same, are afraid to express differing opinions or feelings, value other opinions and feelings more than our own, put others, other people's needs and desires before our own, embarrassed to receive recognition and praise or gifts, judge everything you think, everything you think harshly or as never good enough, we are perfectionists, are extremely loyal, remaining in harmful situations too long, do not ask others to meet our needs or desires, do not perceive ourselves as lovable and worthwhile, compromise our own values and integrity to avoid rejection of others, 
In its broadest sense, codependency can be defined as an addiction to people, behaviors, or things. Codependency is the fallacy of trying to control interior feelings by controlling people, things, and events on the outside. To the codependent, control or lack of it is central to every aspect of life. Jesus taught the value of the individual. He said, we are to love others equal to ourselves, not more than ourselves. The love of self forms the basis for loving others. The differences between a life of service and codependency take several forms. This is the solution, by the way. Motivation differs. Does the ind individual give himself and his service freely or because he considers himself to be of no value? Does he seek to please people? Does he act out of guilt and fear? Does he act out of a need to be needed, which means he actually uses the other person to meet his own needs? Codependents learn to gain self-worth through Jesus Christ. Christianity teaches that a person has worth simply because he was created by God. Your self-worth is not based on the work you do or the service you perform. Service is to be an active choice. Codependents learn to act rather than react. Codependents allow healthy Christian service to bring joy. Christian faith calls for balanced living and taking care of yourself. Codependents learn to choose balanced behavior rather than addictive behavior and allow others to be in charge of their own lives. Codependents learn to live balanced lives, taking responsibility for their own health and well-being. Codependents learn how to set and hold healthy boundaries to set limits for themselves, not allowing others to compromise those boundaries. Codependents learn to help others in appropriate ways by allowing others to act independently rather than making others dependent on them. Codependents learn to be God-directed and free from compulsiveness, knowing that God brings the ultimate results. Yeah. And there are much, much more, but I don't have time to tell you about them because you're going to want to eat lunch. so, And we're not going anywhere with the food addiction. I'm still in denial about that. so, <clears throat> It's much easier being an addict. <laughs> um, we're telling you about this ministry because we believe that Jesus is all over this ministry. And we're up here because we, we, not just, we don't just want to tell you about it. We want to invite you to come. You know, 6 o'clock on Tuesday nights in the youth building, and hopefully so many of you will come that we'll have to come to the sanctuary. But we, we, do, we do want to invite you. And if you're sitting here and you have a hurt, a hang-up, or a habit, and you would like help with them, please come see us at 6 o'clock on Tuesdays. If you're sitting here and you think you have a hurt, hang-up, or a habit that you've overcome, please come see us on Tuesdays because we could use help with helping others. And if you're sitting here thinking that, hey, I really know somebody that could sure use this program, and maybe I should tell them about it, come see us because we also have a meeting for codependency and you might have a chair there too. Thank you. I'm grateful for this ministry and as you can see, there's a reason for that. It's a ministry for helping people move from where they were to where they're wanting to go. And not only that, where Jesus wants us to go. And I got ahead of myself when I started, so I'd like to do a reset. I'd like to say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for being our Father. Thank you for sending Jesus to be in our life, not to condemn us, but to save us. Save us from ourselves. Save us from sin. Save us through this program of Celebrate Recovery, Christian Life Church, Life Group, where two are gathered, you are there. I just thank you for this opportunity to surrender, surrender all to you for a life that is worthy of living with your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions or want more information, please visit ChristianLifeRantool.com.